Good on, Steve. How are ye? Welcome to the Candle of Tales podcast. We're sitting down in Cork for the very last pre-recorded post-show chat that we're having after the festive season. So personally, I'm a bit sad that it's coming to a close, but also it's this end of the death series. So it's obvious that it's coming. It's dying a death. Anyway, sorry, bad joke. Um, look, you know, it's the end of, of us being together in isolation kind of with the family, which has been great fun. And now we get to do this one last time with the Ronald Fire and a cup of tea. And we're talking about the death of Colonel Carnock. Yes, we are. Uh, he is a wonderful hero. He's one of my favourites. And I think he was one that I kind of came across relatively late in my love for the Ulster cycle, because as often happens, poor Connolly Carnock, he's a little bit overshadowed by his younger, hotter cousin, Coo Colin. Um, and <laughs> it's a little bit, you know, I, I was, it's only in the last couple of years that I've really found some great stories of Connolly Carnock, like McDaho's Pig, which we released over Christmas, mm. um, that, that sort of show what a great character he is in his own right. And then this story as well, I think, is just. I think for a death story, it's a hell of a good time. Like I, <laughs> I mean, it, it snowed recently, and uh, my seven gear we made a tiny little uh, snowman, and it oh. reminded me when we I called him Little Conal, and um, you know, because the last time we made a snowman, myself and Rue, who's probably editing this podcast, uh, made a giant snowman so big we had to give him a forked beard, a glasses demented a squinty eye and a black eye and uh, we tried to give him you know uh, snowdrops on, on the cheek and stuff it didn't really work but he gave him a sword and we called him Colin Kearney he was the biggest you know snowman I remember ever. that <laughs> I remember that you also gave him a warrior's death by cutting him down as, yeah. uh, before he could like melt away which mm. I think was kind of important which is kind of what happens to this fella he just kind of melts away in a sad decaying decrepit sort of way well I mean he, Almost. this is what I think is so fun about Colonel Carnock's death story, because he, he nearly has a glorious death, and then he nearly has a treacherous death, and then he nearly has a really tragic death, and then he f- he, he pulls it out at the last he minute. He pulls it out, he pulls it he out. He makes it into so, uh, come here, a I warrior just, death. Hey, well, I want you to... That's me doing a rewind noise. Um, Don't do that. <laughs> sorry. Um, I want to go back to the start, because... So the death of Coo Cullen uh, was last week, and also... The I guess t- you can kind of take it off with the next step with Colonel Carnock because he's next in on that scene. But yeah. What happens right after uh, Cucullin dies? Oh yeah, because you kind of finished it right at the moment of his death, which mm. is like where you kind of end that that story, I guess. Can but it, yeah. well, it's the strong ending. Um, but there's a whole moment after Cucullin dies where the army of Maeve is surrounding this pillar stone. The great hero is dead, but the Ulster men are coming. The The warriors are coming. They've woken up from their curse early. They're on the war path. They're about to land down on top of them. And so the fellow who kills Cúchulainn, who's Lugad McCurroy, he basically is afraid to approach Cúchulainn's body for something like three days he's on that standing Stupid, stone. Stupid, uh, like, um, like he's just lingering. Pretending to be dead. He's just looking there. No, they I'm just, fucking. they don't trust him. They don't trust him at all. And so poor Lugit like leaves it as long as he can. And he, it's finally the raven spreading her wings over him that gives him the signal, which is why you see that famous sculpture in the GPO is of the dead Cucullin with the, the, the raven with the wings spread. Class. And that's the signal that Lugit takes to step forward. And what he tries to do is what you do in this culture when you've killed a hero, which is to take the head, which is where the soul is is thought to reside, and you take the weapons. And so he, what what happens when Lugut tries to take Cucullin's sword is that he can't get it out of his hand, that the hero literally has a death grip on his sword. So what he ends up doing is he cuts the tendons on the back of Cucullin's hand. Um, I think it's these fellas, because they make you release your grip. Them, oh, I thought it, them I thought ones on the, the back wrist. of the hand. Oh, okay. I, I, I always thought it was the ones on the back of the hand there. Just, um, yeah. Because Anatomy. that, like, oh, yeah. would, would, make make, would release a grip. Because there's a kind of a rigor mortis thing going on. Like, he's stiffened you up. You can't see us now, but we're both yeah, we're making our hands. <laughs> and, and like, we if just, I was to grip a sword now, if I was which to, tendons See, I'd would. cut you there. But, like, if I do, you see how tight that is as well. Like, yeah, you know, but that's... You, 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 
Are you sure? Mm. I think I always thought it was these fellas back here because that's it's literally that's what's walking. physically pulling your 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 fingers, giving your fingers their ability to grip. Anyway, anyone uh, study anatomy? Anybody <laughs> study anatomy can tell us if uh, is it is it? the back of the hand or the front of the wrist, which are the tendons that you cut. I always, I always thought it was the back of the hand myself, but anyway, close the wrist. Yeah. Moving <laughs> just on. Saying. I'm just saying if below we the may. Hand. Wrist is I don't thing. know if we're ever <laughs> going to be able to move on, but if we can, yeah. what happens when Lugid cuts, whatever the fuck tendons <laughs> Lugid cuts, is that the grip was so tight that the sudden release is, is so sudden that the sword springs out of Kukulin's hand and cuts his arm clean off. Yeah. So that is why Lugid is left one-handed with trying to carry away uh, the head and the sword of Kukulin. That'll hurt you. That'll and that hurt you. is the state in which um, Conal Carnock finds him. Because Conal Carnock and Kukulin, they're cousins, they're first cousins. Their mothers are, are, are sisters, I think. Uh, it's a little confusing. It's a little confusing. That family tree never quite made that sense. That family tree never quite made sense to me either. But I think, or maybe they're not. Anyway, they're, they're, they're allegedly cousins. They may yeah. not be first cousins. Are they fa- are they foster brothers? Or no, are they, are they they're cousins. Okay. They're cousins. They're actually blood related. Okay. Um, as far as I'm aware. Um, okay. Question mark. But yeah, they are. They're related. Uh, I'm pretty sure they're related. Either way, they like there is definitely a like. Uh, There's yeah. a familial relationship there. Absolutely, yeah. And they neither of them have sons. So they, although they have a lot of rivalry, and we will be getting into that actually next week with the champions portion, and hmm. then the uh, and yeah, the Bickerus feast, which will be the next couple of podcasts, we'll tell crack. where we're getting back to the Ulster heroes in the prime of their life, balchy as fuck, and and fighting over who gets the biggest <laughs> piece of meat in the dinner, um, which we all fought over. Which best of a season, of course, of course it is. Um, yes, it was very handy actually that you don't eat meat anymore because I was like, well, it's mine. Then. <laughs> I only have to fight our father. <laughs> I had the biggest bit of the nutlow. So yes, you had the biggest bit of the nutlow. <laughs> Colonel Carnock would be uh, very satisfied with that. Onion is I'm great. sure. Would <laughs> be only delighted. Cranberry nut loaf, you say. <laughs> anyway. Anyway. Uh, so Colonel Carnock and Kukulin had this mutual arrangement that whichever one of them died, the other would avenge his death. And so uh, this was Colonel Carnock's duty when Kukulin was killed, was to avenge him. Which is kind of an important thing and we see it coming up in a few different stories. Like in some ways that's the story that Lugan McCurroy is on when he kills Ku Cullen uh, because that is vengeance mm-hmm. for Ku Cullen Absolutely. killing Ku Roy McDara, which Ku Cullen did uh, with the assistance of Ku Roy's wife who secretly was in love with Ku Cullen. Um, so there's, there's this whole custom around vengeance killing and honour killing which is kind of interesting in, in ancient Ireland and in, in the mythology because it's very, um, very cycle of violence You know, it's not a great system. It's not a great system. Again, like in terms of their familiarity, I think it's it's good to hack back to the, the death of Coo story where he goes off with the wife of Colin Kiernick, who has various names that have come across. Uh, Niamh been one and also, oh, I found it hard to pronounce. Do you remember? Lendower. Lendower. Yeah. Um, Lendower was what I had her as in, in Bickerous Feast. Yeah. Pause while Aaron takes his clothes off. Oh, Jesus. Um, it's, very, it's very warm. I was drinking tea and the hot yeah, the fire. He was drinking tea and sitting lap. by a fire. And oh, and obviously, as anybody knows, that just means you have to start stripping. Just yeah. whatever. Whatever. Just stripping. Stay. Just like de- <laughs> stripping it, taking off a layer. It's sort kind of, of Jesus, funny how on. often I have walked into a room over the last two weeks to see Aaron just like pulling a shirt off. <laughs> and being like, all right, I guess. There was yes, one, this is how this works. And there was one day when I, I came back from Big Long Walk with Tony and I was wearing all the under armour and I started cooking straight away and then the the kitchen got hot and the, like the sweat that I hadn't like I hadn't really fully stopped sweating now it's just started going mental altogether and I was just roasting and I just had to take all the t-shirts and yeah. everything off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Half naked brothers lying around the place. <laughs> ah, Christmas. Uh, anyway, <laughs> right, go, moving on. Um, anyway. Okay, so they have this... Uh, Dead to each other. Colin Garnick has said, right, whoever one of us dies, you'll avenge me and I'll avenge you. He has to avenge Coo Cullen. Mm-hmm. And he comes down and he sees uh, Lou Goodman fucking chopped well, up. He sees his your hand. man with the head and he sees your man with the sword. 
So I don't think he catches them in the act, but he sees like the fella that has like he 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 undeniably is he the guy quite who quite literally catches him right. You have my cousin's head <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. in your one hand, and that you're also trying to hold his sword in. And this is again after the Ulster men supposedly wake up after the curse and, uh, and of, of oh yeah, hands. and they go and they and they lay waste, and the plane is known as the plane of slaughter or something like that. But Conal is the first to the fight. Conal is the first to the fight. Class. Conal is the first to the fight, and Conal catches up with with Lugid and. They have a single combat, which is kind of weirdly comical in that, you know, Lugid kind of goes, it's not fair because I've only got one hand. And then Conal says, OK, I'll turn, I'll tie my hand behind my back. And then Conal's horse takes a big bite out of Lugid's side <laughs> and he cries out at the injustice of it. So the, I, I, I feel like a lot of Conal Karnak stories have this vein of kind of black humor in them yeah, yeah, that I yeah, really yeah. like like he's this big energetic killer but there's a there's a real like little glint of malice in there and, and like yeah. laughing at the violence like yeah. I don't know yeah, yeah. No, but the, even the fact that all of the women that love Colin Carnick go around with their neck twisted because he's a twisted neck to show that they're oh, his yeah. girls. That's my like, favourite thing about the Ulster Cycle. Okay, one of my favourite things about yeah, the Ulster Cycle is one. that all of... <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> all of the girls who like Coo Colin go around with one eye squinted. All of the girls who like Colin Carnock go around with their heads on one side to show that they like Colonel of the Crooked Neck. But now modern girls don't need, need to do that at all because they won't be defined by who they like. I can't remember what the Leary girls do, but the Leary girls do something as well. Um, anyway. Anyway. <laughs> right. Like, I mean, they can't have their beards in a fork because they don't have enough facial hair in the those days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're only, they're only young. Stop, stop with the tweezers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Let it grow out. Let it grow, let it grow out. out and then you can fork your beard. And then you can really show that you're Colonel's girl. With a forked beard and your head on one side. I don't know what, I don't know where that tangent came from, but I was having fun. Anyway. Good. So he kills, uh, what's his name? Uh, one Lugan and McCurroy. McCurroy. And, and that's kind of like, okay, almost Colonel Carnick now, I guess, becoming the champion of Ulster, I assume. Because See, I don't know that he actually officially does. Yeah, cause because it's kind of the downfall of 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 Ulster. At this well, stage that's that's the there. that's one of the things, and that's the thing. That's why you know Crowher McNessa kept Ku Cullen so safe and wouldn't actually let him go and do what was arguably his job, which was, hey, you're the only one not affected by this deadly curse. Go fight an army. Um, and it, it can be a little bit weird as to like, well, why didn't he just send him to do that? Like, he's a warrior. His job is to die for his tribe if if needs be. But actually, there's a prophecy uh, in the Ulster cycle that if the champion of Ulster is killed, Ulster will be luckless forever. Which is bleak. Mm. You don't want to be the king. It's very bleak. Who is the king of an Ulster that becomes luckless forever? It's not very lucky. I wouldn't. I wouldn't say it's a very lucky place. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like you know. It's, it's it definitely hasn't been very lucky That's, for a while. Yes, are not doing great. I mean, we love you, but you're not doing great right now. It's not their fault. They're it's like not your fault. There's a lot going on. Adopted, we're not stolen child. We're not. We're not Sorry. going to get into poor orphan changeling Ulster <laughs> <laughs> right now. <laughs> That was a lot better than me. <laughs> that was a lot better than me. Okay, so Colin Kiernick, not actually the champion, but at the same time, it's good to note that, like, you know, he was amazing, as we'll see in the, in the next story. Lou, your man, Louis, or um, Leary Leary Buyuk. Buyuk tried to claim a bit, of, but basically, Colin Kiernick and Kukul were born of the same era, and it was kind of amazing. He's kind of like the Messi to his Ronaldo, he's the Federer to his Nadal, he's the Neville Longbottom to his Harry Potter. Potter. I understood one of those references. Yeah. Aaron's very proud of his sports references. I mean, you I'm know, sure they're very good. But yes, but there's, a, I mean? like, there's a whole thing like... How could these two like, people be born at the same time? But that's, that's what's really fun about it because like Conal Kiernock has all the ho- all the hallmarks of the archetypal hero as does Satanta later Cucullin. They have the mysterious birth. Uh, they're both connected with like the mother swallowing a mayfly from a glass. Uh, in, in the case of Conal Kiernock, it's, it's from a healing well. <laughs> Um, There's always a suspect about that one, though. I think that Drew went, now that we've slept together, because that was actually how we get pregnant, also drink a mayfly. That that is a modern reinterpretation (laughs) by cynics. Cynics, I say. not cynical at all. Cynics. Anyway, um, they they have the magical quality to the birth. 
they have um there's often a question mark over the over who the father is in mm-hmm. mythic heroes mm-hmm. which they mm-hmm. both have mm-hmm. because as you say there is a mm-hmm. druid involved um they have the extraordinary circumstances of their actual birth uh prophecies around both of them the Conal Karnak is prophesied to be a great warrior uh, his uncle tries to kill him on the day he is born and fails. Hence crooked neck. Hence he is also not able to be killed by any one warrior of Connacht. So he's basically this like That was a slippery one, wasn't it? This man will never be killed by a Connacht man. Yeah. And like then you look a Connacht man. Listen, it's like, prophecies are always gosh, fucking like that. Sneaky fucking druids. They are always like that. Tell You've me, got to leave enough of a loophole in the language for the future to happen. Good. Okay, like that. Because otherwise we're all fucking bound into certainty and then, yeah, no one likes that. I don't know, entropy destroys the whole universe, probably. Too much uncertainty, kind of like now. Scary. Maybe a bit in the middle. Like, Maybe a bit in the middle. Yeah, <laughs> you got to leave, you got to leave them open-ended. But like, yeah, conal has got all of the hall- hallmarks of the like classic archetypal hero. Also, neither of them have sons, which is another characteristic of this type of hero. They don't have children or their children don't survive. Yeah. Don't and like, survive. neither of them have a successor. So, yeah, which is yeah. why they have this this pact of whoever dies first, the other will avenge him. Makes sense. Um, and yeah, Conal has, also has uh, an interesting family. <laughs> yeah, how, again, the fact the blood ties to Connacht, and like it's interesting yeah. to have the, the the links always there in the Ulster cycle between the heroes and champions of Ulster and the the Connacht people. It's kind of like Come here, that's very things. Irish, though, isn't it? Because, like, you kind of the same thing in the, the Tua de Dana and the Fomorians. Like, mm. if you look at the Battles of Moitura, which we'll be doing later this year. Yeah, yeah. Like, and we've done a little bit in the podcast as, uh, already, I think. Like, half of the fucking Tua de Danon are half Fomorian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the other half of the Fomorians are half Tua de Danon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, like, you know, four out of seven of the Fomorian kings are like, no, we're not fighting the Tua de Danon. Actually, we're pretty good mates with them. There are cousins. Like, there are cousins. <laughs> there are exactly. Like, and, you know, as we often say, there's a real locality to who you're, who you're, whose side you're on yeah, in Ireland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, if you go to Donegal, the National Theatre is the Ballor Theatre. Yeah, He's not yeah. a bad guy in Donegal. The Fuck off with your Fomorians are evil. The National Theatre. Theater. Like it's just the, and the county theatre. The same way, we, or well, no, the nationally funded theatre. <laughs> okay, sorry, there we go. Yeah, no, I, I, I was like, the, that doesn't make any sense. Stop being what? condescending about that Donegal. That just didn't make any sense. Okay, it does. Um, yes. I also want to point out that uh, you, you've you've sounded more cork in that sentence. And oh, is that why you were giggling? Very, that's a very Irish thing, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, it's great that is you're that why you were home. giggling. We got to huh? kick that Dublin out of you. Got to get that mm-hmm. like slant that you realize the whole thing. You realize. You know? I'm going back up to work to start working in an office in Dallas. It's going to be back sake. in about five seconds. Uh, the worst. I'm just glad that we have it on record of Listen. my sister sounding nice. <laughs> Fucking cock. <laughs> my cock. My cock. Anyway, I'm very happy. Anyway. Um, Calm down. Calm down. Okay. I just, I, I love being home. Um, <laughs> so anyway, th- this story then begins because we have the worst thing that could possibly happen. Any great hero is they achieve everything they've ever wanted. And it's kind of, you know, it's it's a bit of a it's a bit of an interesting one for this culture as well because it is a, it is a culture where you are supposed to go out fighting mm. and you are supposed to die in battle and that is a good death. And for these warriors who live by this warrior code, dying peacefully in your sleep is bad and that's not what they want. It's bad. And so, you know, we kind of I remember having a similar attitude to to the Skahuk thing when it was like, well, what is it? What does a warrior woman do when she has killed everybody who challenges her you know she she decided to set up a legacy she decided to set up a school um but conal carnock kind of has a much sadder end he's offered the kingship of ulster after uh crohor mcness's death but he doesn't want it he turns it down yeah, fuck that. uh he's he's not it's not it's not for him mm. i don't see anything in conal's character that <laughs> indicates that he has a shred of diplomacy in his entire body yeah, um, it's that big kind of again the the, the the kind of the Ned Stark thing in in Game of Thrones. I'm like, oh, I don't want to do that. Don't make me do the politics. I don't I, want to be a politics person. I think he's considerably less grounded than Ned Stark <laughs> in Game of Thrones. Sure, I think he's considerably more chopping off heads is great fun, yeah. and I would rather be doing that than settling arguments. And if you come to me with an argument. 
and chop off and chop both of your off. heads. <laughs> How would that be? Yeah. Like, he's just a little bit too... He, this is the thing about Conor Kearney. quickly revoked that invitation <laughs> for him to be king when he like, said that. He's a bit too wild. Yeah, yeah. And he's a bit too unconstrained. And he's a bit too much is Conal. And I think that that, com- that kind of comes through as well in like the, the appetite thing. Because he's got this mythic scale appetite which is essentially his downfall but like it does does it also kind of lead to like is there kind of a, a, a kind of painting someone out to be that monstrous that huge yeah. appetite that otherworldly insatiable appetite yeah does that also bolster him into his prowess and his oh i think feats so. and his strength and all of that i think aspect? i think it's a little bit of the like like if you think about other characters in Irish myth that have a big appetite, you're you're looking at people like the Dagda, who's like mm-hmm. the good god who's skilled at everything and is the kind of all father with all of the talents. So like, you know, big appetites are, are not a bad thing in Irish myth. But I do think there's something kind of, there's something about Conal's character that is that sort of unconstrained, unfettered like slightly dangerous, savage, wild character. Like in MacDowell's pig, when they're arguing over who's going to divide the pig that is meant to feed the entire two armies. And he eats the back half of it in one fucking swallow. Like he's got a, he's got a, like a grotesque appetite. It's, it's much, much larger than life. Mm. And that features quite a bit in his death story. Uh, because he, of course he gets sick. He gets leprosy. And then the only people who can afford to keep him. Well, before we... Even be, before that, before actually. Before we yeah. get, get there, because on the, on the Epic Appetite, that's kind of what sets it off. So he kills Ket McMothock, which is mm-hmm. like his uncle, who gave him the crooked neck. Mm-hmm. And then... And he's done it. He's he's achieved the thing. He's ah, finally, Ket is now. Well, he's he's finished. killed his greatest enemy. Yeah. and like you know, you remember Ket McMothock is the guy who who put okay. the brain ball in Crowhar McNess's head that eventually killed him seven years later. Like Ket has been a pest, a pest for a long time. He has been, you know, this is this is the thing. Ket is the Connacht version of Conal. Right. Like they're very very similar. They really Absolutely. work as foils to each other because mm. Ket is the one who comes raiding into Awan Maka. Mm-hmm. And steals the brain from the shelf that because he thinks it'll be a great prank. Like they're both this kind of like little bit merry prankster, but a little bit too scary for it to be funny. Oh yeah, it's it's terrifying. They're like. both m- mental lads all together, and and yet they have as all of the warriors in this time and it's showed up a number of times in this they have a warrior code so they go back to the one-on-one combat and they face each other Keth loses this but mm-hmm. leaves Conal in such a way that he, he has to be carried off by a conic guy who, who can't bring himself to kill him yeah. outright because he's like no that's not the proper death for a warrior I can't do that it's the warrior system again so we've well, got to kind of I wait don't, I don't think it's even that he's trying to give Conal Carnock a good death. I think it's more a case of I don't want to be the man who killed a sick man. I don't want to be the man who killed someone who was nearly dead. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah Do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah, like yeah, it's yeah. it's also his own honor and his own code true, and yeah. how it reflects on him as a warrior or him as a as a as a person of of some status. And yet, which is like this is the really funny kind of dichotomy of this whole <laughs> honor code system. It's like, oh no, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't. Be, whether it's being seen to maybe mm. see, he'd be more visible doing it kill a, a, a weak man who's hurt after uh, after a one-on-one combat but I will be seen to come bring him back heal him up and then probably when he's still you know 60% go out and yeah. fight him then when I still have a bit of an advantage but go, like, out, go ahead and fight him when he can stand up and hold a sword like, like. definitely like um, what's the word uh, the, the false bad Deniability, plausible deniability. Sorry, that took a second. You got there. <laughs> For Jesus, I don't you know. You got there. there. And my brain I had a car crash in the middle of it. Sure uh, is. But then, yet, he's still able to go, here, lads, uh, you go in there now and you well, that's stab the him thing. in the night. And it's the appetite that cues him in. Yeah. He goes, well, hang on, this guy is not fucking oh right <laughs> at all. Oh God. This is not okay. Yeah, it my he's eating. He is eating everything I own for breakfast and then the same amount again for dinner and tea so he's 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 kind of in this um he's in a really tight spot but it's also the thing if he's given his word now Mm. so he can't break his word so what he does is he tries to get around that by sending in his son right yeah yeah, yeah. um what's his name by the way i forgot i forgot it 
Fuck. Anyway, you will recognize him on the podcast Bel- as the character. Belku? Oh, is he Belku? Belku? I think he might be Belku. Anyway, he's the character whose name begins with a B who takes him from the Jesus, if I remember that, no, that, that you that, tell that'd me. Very, that'd be great. That'd be very good. That might have been Belku, I think. Anyway, yeah. moving on from um, Belku, because Belku comes to a sticky end by trying to get out of the... Uh, <laughs> Out of his his honourable system with Colonel Carnot. Uh, yeah, and eventually, obviously, the lads all, all, all die, and and then leprosy. It's the first time I've seen leprosy in Irish myth crop up. Yeah, right, it crops up from time to time. Mm-hmm. I went cork again there, didn't I? With oh, the era. Oh, Karen, <laughs> no, don't be self conscious of it, no girl. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, it's so the first time I remember it cropping it, up. Anyway, it comes up. I have seen it a few times. It, it comes up a good bit in the saint stories. So Bridget heals lepers at various different points. There are lepers. There are lepers in Celtic myth. There are lepers lepers in Arthurian myth. I don't think leprosy was as um, prevalent here because it tended to be worse in hotter countries. I don't know enough about leprosy to know why that is, but it tended to not be as as bad or as endemic in, in damp, killed damp it. places. The damp basically. mold killed it. Something like that. I don't know why it thrives in hot, dry places, but apparently it doesn't like the climate here, so you didn't get as much of it. But it was still a thing and it was still be the like only one. it was still a kind of a that doesn't quiet work. you. <laughs> doesn't work. Um it was still one of these things that like I don't think I think it later had this real association of like somebody being cursed or unclean. I don't get that vibe from this story. Oh no, it seems like, oh no, he's leprosy, he's definitely it fucked now. It just seems like, yeah. It <laughs> he's just, just sidelined. Like he's physically fucked now and he can't fight anymore and he can't be a warrior anymore. And he's got this degenerative disease that is eventually going to kill him kind of gruesomely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, he's not, he's not ostracized. He's not made to wander the, wor- the the roads begging. He's still kind of given his due as a person of status. Massively, yeah. Like, massively. To a so, weird degree where his well, greatest enemy takes him in. Well, like, that's very Maeve. That's very, very in keeping with what she, the, kinds, the kinds of things that she does. Because, like, think about it. Who was, who was her biggest enemy before the Tawn? It was the champion of Ulster. It was fucking Fergus McRoy. Right. He, she takes him in when he, when he comes to her door. Oh, yeah. Like, sight unseen, she takes him in and gives him a feast for three days and then says, why are you here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, general. that is her way of greeting people. Like, that's very in character for Maeve to do that. Yeah. And, like, she's never... She, she takes people in. She always takes people in when they need to be taken in. But, like, she's also somebody who will always keep an eye out to the utility of people. Yes, and she does that brilliantly. Which she absolutely does with this, because she takes Conal Karnak in when she's the only... Because, like, also, it's a fucking status thing for Maeve, too. Nobody can afford to feed this man. (laughs) The woman who went to war because her bull wasn't as big as her husband's bull and, like, created this massive devastation because... People were saying she was a little bit poorer, a little bit poorer than her husband. Consort. Is absolutely 100% going to go, oh, nobody can afford to feed this man. I'll fucking feed him and you'll watch me. And I'm going to keep wearing gold rings on every single one of my fingers because this is not even a drop out of my back pocket because that's how fucking rich I am. Yeah. And like... Better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like that is such a myth. No bother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, made, that does make sense. That I mean, like in, t- in terms of the status and actually showing off, that makes sense. Because I, I, yeah. I couldn't figure it. But it's all of it because she she works on multiple levels. It's yeah, all of yeah, those yeah, things, yeah, yeah, and it's yeah, yeah. also the fact that she knows that he is still <laughs> vicious, a vicious killer, and she knows that he has absolutely no loyalty to anybody in her house. Yeah. Which comes in pretty handy when she wants to get the thing away from her now. Yeah, no, she's she she decides she's done with Oliel McMothock, uh, which is interesting. Hilarious, which is a total flip on her whole. You're not allowed to be jealous, but I'm allowed to be jealous. She never like. I, <laughs> <laughs> when you hear that, you're like, ah, oh, what the for God's sake? Yeah, Are you kidding me? Listen, listen, listen. <laughs> Sorry, you. 
Like the double no, standards. There's, is, this, is not a, this is not a double standard. This is a, that, is, that is literally a double standard. Is, that is exactly what the definition a, of a double standard is. It's not a double standard. Is like a thing that happens on a cultural level. You know, you've got like one rule for one type of person and one rule for another type of person. This oh, is not sorry. that. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. It's hypocritical. This is a sorry, private, <laughs> completely hypocritical. private piece of hip- hypocrisy. Ah. But it is also a private agreement between two people. And like. People get to define their relationships how they want to. I'd say all oh, didn't see this define print I'm on that one. Not saying <laughs> I think he knew damn well. I think he knew damn well. And also he was the jealousest motherfucker. Mm. He killed Fergus McRoy. And she knew he killed Fergus McRoy. Yeah. Didn't so like him for that. He killed Fergus. He did all these shenanigans during the town to try and fucking break them apart. Oh, the death of Fergus. Really. Um, you know, he was not, he was very much not okay with that and very much pretending to be okay with it because they had this, you know, Maeve had made him promise to have no jealousy. Uh, because, I mean, Oliel, like, remember how they got together? He was her bodyguard. She started sleeping with him. Her husband at the time, who was, who was, um, her her kind of consort slash king of Connacht, who had also made the arrangement never to get jealous, got jealous mm. and said, you need to choose between us. And Maeve said, well, if you want to fight over me, fight over me. Yeah. And Oliel killed him. So like, he knew exactly who he was marrying. Fair, okay. Like, you can't, you can't fucking marry somebody who's cheating on her husband with you and who says, by the way, these are the marriage vows I want from you. Don't be stingier than me. Don't be behind me into a battle because I'll be embarrassed of you if you're not at the front with me. And don't be fucking jealous because I can't be dealing with it. He did not have to say I do, lads. That was his bed. He fucking made it. He lay in it. He didn't like it. And that was his fucking lookout. Fair, anyway, fair. I'm I'm Rant. low on sympathy for Oliel because I do think he's a little bit of a snake, and I just have a little bit of a bias against him because I think. I mean, I I, I forever <laughs> don't like him because he killed Fergus McRoy, which is a story we didn't tell in this death series. In a series. really ne- mean, nasty, <sighs> horrible way that really, really, really hurt somebody very sweet, and yeah, there are so few amazing. sweet people in and these Fergus stories. Fergus was just so nice; he was just like left on his back, looking up like that. Oh, no, I'm not talking about Fergus. I'm talking about Oliel's brother. The blind fella. Oh, I just don't like him because he killed Fergus. Yeah, well, remember how he killed Fergus. Uh, he got your mind. Fergus's for... best friend, Oliel's brother, who's blind. That's, That's who I'm talking about. I mean, like, well, yeah. I mean, Fergus is sweet, but he's also a stone cold motherfucking killer who beats the shit out of people and kills them a lot. I just like, like Fergus, but yeah. Okay. I also like Fergus, but I'm like, there's a, like, I, I feel like all you <laughs> just like dicks over a true innocent for no reason. Yeah, no, you're dead right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just to be like, well, I didn't personally do it. Okay, go on, tell that. Anyway. Tell, you're um, going to have to uh, tell that bit again. It's a, it's a bit where Fergus and Maeve are swimming. And Fergus had, had basically, when Fergus was in Connacht, he struck up a great friendship with all brother, who was blind. Um, can you remember his name? No. I can't remember his name either. Anyway, he was blind and he was, but he was also a dead shot. Yeah, Fergus used to go hunting with him. And if you could point him in the direction of a deer and tell, and he was able to like hear where the deer was, he could hit it with a spear. 10 out of 10, absolute bullseye. And Fergus thought he was the greatest. And they had a great friendship and they were really good friends. They were really close. One day they all went swimming in a lake. Maeve and Fergus went in swimming together and started doing the do in the water. And Oliel went up to his brother, his blind brother, and said there is a deer and a stag in the water and put a spear into his hand and pointed him at Fergus McRoy and had his blind brother murder his best friend so that Oliel could say that he didn't do it. He... No sympathy oh, for yeah. that. Oh yeah, no sympathy. No Absolutely sympathy. None. 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 You just point. I, I always get the image of him just like, okay, here you go and go. Pointing yeah. and nasty, nasty. Like, anyway. Anyway, digression because this we didn't tell man. that story that time. We, we, we'll get to it another we'll, time. We'll get to it another time. That's basically it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, oh yeah, I forgot. We forgot your man's name. Um, but yeah, like, that's, and, and then it was Oliel who, and then... He cheated on his wife. Just come back. Just come back. 
<laughs> How dare he? I'm I'm converted. How dare he? Shake harder. <laughs> Shake harder, <laughs> boy. Uh, we watched The Simpsons the other day. Um, and then all of them, the cults came back. Yeah, um, all of them. God. So anyway, eventually, okay. So Maeve goes, "Sweet, you can do me a favor. You can kill him because you don't give a shit." And and he basically realizes this is fucking great. This will piss everybody off, and mm-hmm. this can be the thing yeah. that Connie sends Carnum me out in big glory. Delighted because, like. He's been in Connacht, in the home of his enemies. Just waiting to just take a fight. Talking, just waiting. Just waiting. <laughs> but I, th- I think you know, he's kind of like, you know, when your aunt comes over and, and about two and a half glasses of wine in, and you're like, oh, she's just pegging for a fight. Yeah, she's yeah, yeah. She's just yeah. pegging for yeah. our, our, our uncle or that particular You know person. the one. You know the one. You all know the one. <laughs> You're all picturing them in your head right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know the one who comes up. Yeah, yeah, absolutely gets over and is like, oh, and he's just, gosh. he's sitting there waiting to pick just a fight. waiting for somebody to say something that they can hop on top of and be like, I <laughs> just drop in the little fucking Bikru's feast angle that'll mm-hmm. get everybody fighting with everybody else. Um, yeah, no, he's, I think he's, like, it's funny because you would wonder, I think he's a little bit sunk in depression. I think he's a little bit out That's of it at this maybe, stage. Yeah, because true. he, like, Leprosy, I yeah. feel like young Connell would have just fucking... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah just yeah, yeah. gone murdering again um, after well, dinner. Yeah, he, he, again, essentially as well, it's the, it's the slow decay without a huge amount of grace and certainly... He's not youthful. He is old. He's slow. He's heavy. He's, he's literally, literally falling, apart. falling apart. And like that is a difficult uh, place to be for anybody. Well, but, like it's, it's that particularly slow for, for decline. A person who has been physically active and physically brilliant. Yeah. I think that physical decline must be incredibly difficult. Yeah. I have luckily insulated myself against this by never being physically brilliant in my youth. <laughs> <laughs> that's so. not no that's not how you do that sorry, okay. that's not how you do that so I'm going to be okay with it I'm just going to slowly slide comfortably I into mean, senescence and I'm be grand like I crocked my back this morning I, did, I, I didn't do a stretch this morning I was like ah and you were the one who did, did the yoga this morning and I was like ah, I should do that and I went in and I, literally I did a lovely yoga session this morning my hair back off my forehead and I did it with a bit of hip movement or something. I threw me fucking back out. You I did it. it. You did it with too much panache. Oh, I did too much, too much panache. Take down the panache. You did, you did a full shampoo ad hair oh, flick. And you crocked your back. Crocked all day. So yeah. I get it. Getting older is hard and sore and painful. Doesn't mean you're supposed to just like give up though. That's not hey, the meaning of the story. Sorry. I, had a really, I didn't say I gave up. I said I was never physically brilliant in my youth. <laughs> Right. <laughs> Which means I'm never going to experience that that unique pain of being like, oh, I used to be the best in the world at this. Oh, yeah. And now I'm not quite there anymore. I mean, that's... And like, I'm never going to get that good ever. I've, I've reached my physical peak. I, I left my potential in the bag. If you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I just, I just left it there. It, <laughs> infinite... Don't ever look in at your potential. In theory. Um, in practice, probably wouldn't have been much greater than what I actually did with myself in my, in my, in my youth. Um, but I mean, you know, I never really tried to push it. Yeah, I mean, this, I'm, that's not... I'm the, happy with my choices. Not the message to be sending out there, is it? Who's sending fucking um, messages? The message is, of this story is kill people. It'll be gas. It's metaphor. There's deeper <laughs> meanings, Zorka. There's layers. No, it's no, It's like no. an onion. Nah. Um, there are layers. <laughs> All right. We've been really? through this. Mythology is covered <laughs> in layers. Sticky so, ones. Tasty ones. Cheating on your wife is an allegory for what exactly? Uh, Dishonesty in general. And, uh, sure. And murdering the host that is feeding you is a metaphor for... Doing what is true to your nature. Yeah, it's not bad. Boom! Ah! Um, I, so, don't, I don't think you won that one. <laughs> boom! I, I said boom. I said boom. <laughs> so um, anyway, so that's... Brilliant. Colin Kiernick gets chased off and, of course, not killed by a Connick man. He's killed by a, every one of them, stabbing him and gouging him and kicking him. And, and they're all, he's delighted. They're delighted. He's probably a bit sore, but he's like, finally, someone killed me. Yeah. And no, he finally be... he finally dies at, at Ballyconnell, which is named after him to this day. And that is exactly what a warrior wants. Yeah. 
He wants to die in a memorable way, in a memorable place. And that's what Conal gets. And so i got to imagine that he's fucking delighted. Delighted with that. Delighted with, with that, that. conclusion to his, to his violent life. So, come here. <laughs> that's the end of our uh, death series. Yes. And we've basically come to an end. Of course, there's loads of stories we could have put in there. There's loads of other deaths. Again, for this There's a lot of deaths. We but kind of we, we you know we wanted to truncate it. We we're getting on to a, a brighter, uh, merrier kind of a, a January story as well to to shine some happiness and crack into the the grimness of things. Yeah, no, um, it'll be fun. We're doing a we're doing a two parter next, which is the the it's basically the champions portion in two bits. We've got Bickeru's feast next week, and yeah. then the. The continuing contest for the champions portion of Ulster the which, week after that. Which is class. It's one of my favourite stories that we've told loads of times live and had lots and lots of fun with it. Uh, yeah. but it, it, it briefly, uh, people might know about the four cycles of Irish mythology being the Ulster cycle, the Fianna cycle, the King cycle and the mythological cycle. Uh, and that's kind of how we know them. So I was introduced to Irish myth originally. But there was an older system in the oral storytelling and that was to not necessarily break them up into that system but also uh, yeah have it's a kind of an interesting themes. it's a kind of an interesting thing cuz like as well whatever uh, this is mostly something that I got from reading a book called Celtic Heritage by Reese and Reese and it is um it is an interesting book I do not I don't know how incredibly accurate it is some people I believe argue with it I don't know anyway not well up on the scholastic arguments but anyway there um Research, conjecture, question mark. I've heard the same from different places as well. So is yeah, that these stories were broken into kind of thematic groups rather than by cycle. So you wouldn't necessarily get together and tell all of the Fianna stories. You would get to d- together and tell stories about voyages or stories about uh, deaths or stories about births Birth. or stories about battles or stories about, you know, going into the Cattle other world. Raids or... Yeah, you <laughs> kind of, so you group them by theme, not by, um, I guess, personalities or by branch of mythology. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So it's a little bit different. And what we did when we were kind of starting to retell these stories, we kind of played around with that a little bit. Yeah. Because we played around with telling just death stories and telling, you know, a, a group of death stories from all over. But actually, it's a lot harder for modern audiences because we don't know these characters that yeah, well. Yeah, that's the thing. So in order for people to kind of make sense of it, we tend to keep them pretty much in their kind of wider arcs and in their wider context, which is why we'll tend to tell the tone as a, as a whole set of stories. And we'll, we'll, you know, we decided when we were telling deaths that we would do the specifically the deaths of the Ulster heroes yeah. and Maeve of Connacht as well, um, that we'd kind of keep it contained to these particular, uh, to this particular branch yeah. of and storytelling. It, it's really interesting to kind of look at that because I think we've live storytelling and, and what you say with the uh, kind of modern audience, I think it's, even as when we're kind of putting together stories and we're looking at how to digest the information ourselves to tell them to be received as well, it's neater. It, there's like, we're kind of, we're almost, it's nicer just to put it into a box where all it's, you know, they're all in the same kind of category. They're, they're cousins, they're related to each other, they're in the same story and we can kind of be in that world for a bit longer or we go down to the Fianna and we tell the Women of the Woods story or whatever it is. It's like the women that are related to the Fianna members or the, the, the links that are, 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 that we can kind of bite on to we can stay in that world or this world for a bit yeah, of Yeah, we're not, time. we're not jumping around because it gets, it gets confusing when you don't know who they are. Yeah. It's a little bit like, like fucking crossover comics you know what i mean if you if you are following yeah, the dc yeah. universe or the marvel universe and you pick up a crossover comic you're fine because you know who all of these characters are there you go, but if you've from. never seen avengers and you walk into fucking end game you're not going to know what the hell is happening yeah. or why you should care about these people so that's kind of why we we like to keep them in their different groups yeah. and that was something we talked about recently as recently in fact as saturday when we had the first class of our storytelling course online, the very first yeah. one, the 
arc of storytelling. Uh, yeah, nice segue. Um, I was impressed with that. Thank um, you. That was very exciting and we're going to be continuing this on for the next, it's a six week course and we were kind of blown away. Thank you very much for our podcast listeners who shared and got in contact with it as well, with us as well because we were kind of blown away by people actually contacting us going, oh, I want to be in a storytelling course. Uh, we're having a ball teaching this course. We've mm-hmm. uh, taught this in person uh, a few times now, now that we're getting it all on on screens. It's, it's, a, it's a new challenge but it's great fun to actually get it get it together and be able to teach this and actually bring that level of performance back. I felt a real buzz after doing it. Anyway. Uh, I know. He yeah. was wired. I was move. fucking wired. But it was, it was you know, people on screen actually interacting, playing the, 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 the improv games and actually telling stories and the laughter and the joy and all that kind of stuff that are, stories are good for and the level of connection that I miss wholly and hugely from storytelling anyway and being with groups and a friend of mine uh, Lauren Jenkins put, uh, who started off <laughs> telling uh, the death of Coo Cullen with us over a few years ago and then went off to London and uh, started the em- the Embers Collective with with his mates over there and they're brilliant and he just put up a post re- that made me kind of really sad today of like he he, he misses this thing as well mm-hmm. of of transporting people off to another place and seeing it and just having that visceral kind of physical acknowledgement of, of, of that happening and, and that's kind of a, a little bit of a, a sad note but it brings you on to like the the changing and how we're adapting and how we're adapting to the new world order <laughs> or the new world as, as we as we see it at, at the moment yeah the new world that we are all in at the moment uh, for however much longer it lasts um, we're all always adapting you know. I think things always change stories stay in a bit of a weird flux of of being able to be changed and and we're always changing our story I think as well you know uh, and we have Absolutely. to be adaptive and go roll with it and be strong enough and find the resilience in stories as well um, mm-hmm. and absolutely and I'm finding that with this course anyway with and this. yeah we had a great response to this course so we are we are going to run another one uh, we haven't decided on dates yet but if it is something that sounds interesting to you drop us a line and get in touch because um, yeah I think basically as soon as we have numbers to do a second course we will probably set it yeah we, we do you know what i mean people like, have already uh, been asked and so we'll be sending out uh, when we actually set a date we'll be yeah yeah we'll set it so drop us a line if you're interested drop if us not, line if you're interested. no bother um thank you for listening to the death series stories um this whole thing was lovely i think at this time of year with winter closing in things die you know stuff dies and it's all good we've done it and that's the end and we're going to go to the champions portion next um any last words of wisdom from you, Sarga, before you go back to Dublin? Good night. Thanks for listening. <laughs>